It's not about out here and being competitive with other people and looking at other people and saying, oh, less than, better than. It's instead connecting to the part of you that no one can take away and no, you don't have to compete at all. And when you start to let, you start to live more from that place, it starts to come out into outer form and you start to create so much um, flow and success. Hey friends, welcome to Keep It Simple Sexy. I'm Christine Bullock, founder of KO Body Care, certified fitness trainer and mom of two little girls who's just trying to juggle it all and feel as good as possible. I'm so grateful that you're here. Now let's get started, sexy. Hi everyone. Ever feel like you keep running into that same roadblock? You know the one. The one preventing you from getting your business launched, the one that keeps making you sick and tired, the one that puts that weight on even though you're working out. It could be the one that makes your hair fall out or even causes acne and just plain old prevents you from finding true happiness. What is that great grandiose roadblock? Simply our belief system, our belief in ourself and the world around us. Well, good news is today I have Kimberly Snyder, a spiritual guide, meditation teacher, nutritionist, and holistic wellness expert to teach us on how we can rewire our belief system, fulfill our deepest dreams, and create an epic, inspiring life. Kimberly is a three-time New York Times bestselling author, including the book Radical Beauty, which she co-authored with Deepak Chopra. She hosts the top-rated Feel Good podcast. You got to tune into that one, too, and is the founder of Saluna, a holistic lifestyle brand that offers wellness products, digital courses, practical enlightenment, meditation, and the Saluna Circle. She's been featured in all the biggest TV shows and magazines, and most importantly, she's a mommy to two adorable boys. Welcome, Kimberly. Oh, hi, Christine. It's so wonderful to be here with you today. Thank you for that very nice intro. <laughs> <laughs> and she just glows. She's so beautiful. So if you guys are tuning in and listening, you might want to, to check in and just check out her glow on our video podcast as well. <laughs> oh, sweet, I'm so Mama. excited to have you here and congratulations. We're going to get into the launch of your new book. You are more than you think you are. I'm so excited. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. You know, this, this book, Christine, just felt like it wanted to be in the world. The idea came through when I was 34 weeks pregnant with Moses, who's my younger son. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is such an inconvenient time right now. But it was, <laughs> it was strong. And so I, I didn't know what to do. I had this very clear idea. So I reached out to Deepak, who's my co-author two books ago. And he said, wow, this idea belongs with, with Hay House with this certain pub publisher. And so he put us on a connecting email. Next thing I knew, I was presenting the book over Zoom. The pandemic was happening. This was about you know a year, uh, 15 months or so ago. And then next thing I knew, Christine, I signed the book deal three days before um, Moses was born. And then I waited. I gave myself that full 40-day Ayurvedic period. And then more, 60 days later, I started writing. I actually think we might have had, speaking of Moses, our babies down the hall from each other. Penelope, my youngest one, was born June 1st, 2020. Were you, was Moses born around then? Moses was born May 27th. Because I, I we remember seeing you post a picture and I was yes. like, I was just there too. Yeah. So at Cedar Sinai, you know. Oh, yeah. So I was um I was a C-section baby. Mm -hmm. Both my babies were nine pounds and I tried very hard. But um, so I was in the hospital, I think, until you know, maybe we did cross paths because yeah. I was in there for at least four days. <laughs> oh, we yeah, we definitely them. did then. Yeah, it's yeah, all those wow. green goddess smoothies for those babies. <laughs> wow, yes. That's great. Yeah. So we, we all know what that's like. And that's pretty amazing that you basically, you know, the birth of Moses and then, but also this birth of all these ideas. What do you feel like? I mean, I guess to even back it up, how has motherhood changed you, your outlook, whether it is on nutrition and your practices from before, but also your, your spirituality and how you see the world? So, wow, it's, it's changed everything for me, Christine. I have to say that I didn't know um, what kind of what mother, what kind of mother I would be exactly. Um, I think like a lot of us, when we're pregnant, we focus a lot on the birth and 
you know, the first time Emerson, which is my older son now, he's five. I remember when he, first time he was on my chest, I looked down and I thought, oh my God, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I am so in love. And my heart, um, you know, the, the, my heart chakra, you know, what we call the Anahata chakra. I didn't know you could love something, someone so much. And my heart just burst open. And um, so that was one thing, just this ability to love. The second thing that really changed me is that I, f I found that being a mother has helped me heal a lot of my childhood trauma. And I love my boys the way that I think I would have wanted to be loved. So sometimes I, I find myself saying that things to them, you know, your love just for you, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to earn love. I'm almost talking to myself. So I feel like this beautiful healing that's happened through motherhood. And also this, you know, in a practical way, just this real focus, it hones your focus. Because as you know, as a working mama, you know, I've written this book and I have the podcast and I have a business too. And when there's nap time, now when older um, son is in school, I, you know, I sit down, I have to focus. Whereas before my writing process would have been like, okay, I'm going to warm up now. I'm just going to do some writing exercises, then I'll get in. Now it's like, no, 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 you only have an hour and a half. You better jam. <laughs> so it's been, um, it's been amazing. And, you know, some people think, Christine, I think people probably say this to you too. Oh, you have to give up so much by being a mother. But I feel like, you know, the creativity, the expansion, the efficiency, everything has, has grown in my career. And personally, it doesn't mean it's always easy. And, um, you know, you have to call in the village, you have to call in support in ways that, you know, you need, mm -hmm. but I feel like everything has, you know, truly expanded in my life. Mm -hmm. And I imagine too, that that's probably a part of what your turning point was that led you to this book. This is your sixth book, correct? This is my sixth book. Yeah. And what, was this the turning point basically was the kid is, and was there anything else that was going on that led you to talk about such, I mean, it's such a beautiful book. It is the base before we even get into it, but I feel like in wellness, we talk and being in fitness for over 20 years and all that, like nutrition and fitness. But I feel like I've always connected with you because you've always understood that there's a deeper part to this that yeah. you were personally, and I could tell trying to tune into, or I'm always personally trying to tune into, but sometimes that's really hard to get across to the public, right? When they're just like, well, I just need to lose weight or why is my hair falling out? Or why is this happening? Or why am I under stress all the time? But through this book, it's so practically written and it's so in touch with the base of where everything starts, which is yeah. our belief. So anyway, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but it's <laughs> such, it's such a beautiful, well-written book. Thank um, you, love. But at, in the wellness, I get back to my question within that, what was the turning point? Because we yes. can continue to talk about fitness or diet or anything. You know, what made you really want to dive into this? So I'll say there's two parts to the question. Mm -hmm. So when I started out, Christine, as I mentioned in the book, I, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. At one point I wanted to be a doctor so I had a science and math scholarship, a partial scholarship, and I went in and then I spent a summer in a hospital and I was like, oh no, this is actually not for me personally. Um, so I needed to, I wanted to go in a different direction. I didn't know what that was. So I saved up some money and I ended up backpacking around the world for three years, which is where a lot of my philosophy came from actually, just really seeing the, the openness and the, the excellent digestion and the, the joy of, you know, women in all these different countries like Zimbabwe and Japan. And um, I spent seven months in Africa and over 18 months in Asia and some South America. But the main thing, I was, I was out of the Western world for over three years. And India had a really profound impact on me. And it's where I started to learn about yoga and meditation and self-connection. And so I came back to the United States. I came back to New York City um, because my family is from Connecticut and I had a lot of family around there. And I just started living the teachings. I started really, um, you know, what I talk about in the book, which I had never, I've never talked about publicly, but I started to really apply it to my life. And what happened was I was, you know, teaching yoga. I was going back to study nutrition and I started a free blog. 
And things just started growing really organically. I would just tell my yoga students about, you know, I was so passionate about just sharing what was helping me. And it just started to grow and grow. And very organically, um, my first celebrity found me. And I don't even own a TV, to be honest, to this day. I'm, I'm very <laughs> out of like of, of pop culture, to be perfectly honest. I'm not a screen person. I'm a, you know, kind of nerdy. I like to read all the time. My husband likes screens, but I'm not as much. But it just started to grow, Christine. It was so organic. Um, and then, you know, the, the book deals came and television appearances came and all this stuff started to happen. And then my first publisher, my first book deal, which back then was HarperCollins, looked at my site. My, so I, I submitted a proposal to write a book called Catching the Fire. And it was a travel memoir. And it was about teachings I had learned around the world and adventures and what I had learned about myself. And they were like, oh, we'll do that book next. But the food part, the recipes are really popular. So why don't we write a food book first? So that was never actually my original plan. And a lot of people don't know that, but that is the truth. And so that book would go on to become The Beauty Detox Solution, which was my first book now 10 years ago. And that book did well. And so the second book was called The Beauty Detox Foods. And so it just kind of went down this um, food pathway. And I've always, you know, in intermingled, um, you know, my my philosophy, but I haven't written like a full book about it until later. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the background is the, this has always been building in me. And when I was, there was a period before I had children where I was working with a lot of celebrities again, which is funny because I don't watch movies and I don't <laughs> really know what's going on, but I would <laughs> live with them for four months sometimes. And, you know, in between I'm going and uh, press tours and I would do their food and nutrition, but I was also you know, talking to them and we're working, you know, one of our pillars at Saluna is emotional well-being and really, you know, um, helping them process things. I would meditate with some of them, do yoga with some of them. So it was really always a whole. So lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the big turning point, though, uh, was a couple years ago. It was in, uh, you know, it just it, uh, Sometimes I get emotional, but today I feel very centered. It was in 2017. Um, very suddenly, I lost my mom. And we found out she had cancer on Valentine's Day and March 26th. So Valentine's Day is February 14th. March 26th, she was gone. So Christmas that year, she was totally normal. We were hanging out. She was a very energetic, amazing woman. She would immigrated here from the Philippines. You know, she got here on an academic scholarship. She was a real go-getter. She was so alive. She was so amazing. And then we found out she had cancer and then she was gone. And then three days later, Emerson turned one. So I found myself like, you know, what is going on? Like very turned upside down. Like if that can happen, like anything can happen. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it was this impetus for a big change in my life. And then a few, you know, sometime later, a few months later, I realized that although he's a wonderful person, I will never say anything bad about him. I wasn't, you know, wasn't meant to be with Emerson's father. So I moved out on my own and became a single mom. So it was in this period, Christine, where it was like, I was a new mom. I lost my mom. I became a single mom all in a very short time period. And as I describe in the book, this is the period where um, I met with a monk at the Self-Realization Fellowship, which is, um, you know, my teacher Paramahansa Yogananda's Center for Disseminating Kriya Yoga. And he said, go deep for, for, for at least five months, treat your home like an ashram. And that's what I did. I went in, I meditated a lot. I didn't go out very much. I just really focused on finding myself again. And out of that, Saluna was born, Christine. That's really when we launched this brand, which went beyond food because people, you know, from all my work before knew me as this nutritionist, but mm -hmm. we launched Saluna with four principles, food, body, emotional well-being, and spiritual growth. And the spiritual growth part was really, you know, about self-connection and self-awareness to this formless energy inside of us. So it was this turning point of like, wow, like my life is upside down, but this is what I want my life to be. I, I don't want to, you know, settle. I don't want to live this like, you know, smaller life. So the turning point was really that. And then, um, you know, everything just kept growing and unfolding from there. And that um, that's where this book was born from part of that, you know, big awakening of I really want to share what I want to share. And I'm not going to conform to any labels. People think I'm this, but, you know, this is really what has helped me. And so this is really what I want to talk about. 
I mean, you really are. The turning point was truly you living what you are teaching or what you are sharing within this book, which is amazing. And I think one of the lessons that I'm also hearing from you for our viewers is that there's no wrong paths. Like, what an amazing path that you opportunity that you had, even though you did want a, a certain book or a certain way, you know, originally, and you went into the nutritional route. Look at all the doors that that opened for you to elect to support and help other people because you went, but you took the opportunity from, from a very hard situation on so many aspects where we can suppress it and go. It's what, actually one of my husband's favorite things to say, suppress and go. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're, we're dealing with this. Feel and be. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. And you made it, you planted those seeds and made it into, you know, this just beautiful support for so many other people and for yourself. You got to grow from it and, yes. you know, and, and become. So speaking of, you really became your true self. And that's what you touch upon in this book. What is, can you explain what true self is and how we find that? Because I don't know, am I living in my true self? I am unsure. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, and you also touched on that a little bit, Christine, when you said, oh, you started, um, you know, really, we started living your truth and creating. And so there's a very practical chapter in the book called You Are a Creator. And so- Part of this, the true self means that we recognize that we have our physicality and we have all the things we can see with our eyes, the things we can quantify, how much money's in the bank and, um, you know, what our hair looks like and our possessions and just all this stuff out here. Um, in yogic philosophy, that's called, you know, when we identify with all this stuff, which is great, and we still want to improve our lives, that's one aspect of who we are. But the mm -hmm. issue is if we put our full worth in all that we see, that's called the pseudo self, the pseudo soul, or the ego. And if our full worth is just this, then we start to feel very small and limited. And we go empty. into one of the most <laughs> empty and one of the most detrimental stumbling blocks for all of us, comparison. We start to yeah. look around. We start to think, oh, I'm not pretty enough. Maybe I'm too old to try this. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough degrees. And we limit ourselves. So the true self, which is the core teaching of the book, is when we can shift to identifying with the ego, which is suffering and comparison and not good enough and not feeling good enough, into connecting with a part of us that can't be quantified. It is an energy you know, call it the soul, call it spirit inside of you. Eckhart Tolle says the word aliveness. But we know that there's something that's watching our thoughts, even beyond thought. It's beyond construct. There's something that's looking out of our eyes. And so when we start to connect with the true self, we realize that we are completely, each and every single one of us is unique. So universal teaching means that it's true for every single person, every single human that's alive and breathing. It means that each and every single one of us is unique. So that means we bring a unique energy into anything that we do. So in practical terms, this chapter, chapter 19 in the book, which is again called You Are Creator, is about how sharing the process and how I was able to do it in my life, tap into different attributes of this energy inside of you and how we can put that into form and how we can use that to create your best idea, to break through the noise, to get your, you know, website or your feed, um, you know, seen, seen or successful or whatever you want to create, whether it's a book or a flower business on Etsy or mm -hmm. you know, fitness, pro whatever it is, you know, um, a line of a baby. dog food, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a baby. whatever it is, it's about, it's not about out here and being competitive with other people and looking at other people and saying, oh, less than better than, which is what most people do in our society. It's instead connecting to the part of you that no one can take away and no, you don't have to compete at all. And when you start to let, you start to live more from that place, it starts to come out into outer form and you start to create so much um, flow and success. And it's very practical, Christine. We talked about how important it is to be practical. It's like, make this list, tune into this. Now take this list and do this. So you see in the book, like I'm a practical person and I'm a writer, so I need it to be like this. I don't, you know, big ideas are great, but we need to put it into, um, into our lives. So I think we all have that ability. We just have to learn how to do it. 
And I mean, I hope that everybody that's listening has had those moments where, because I feel that same way myself, where sometimes I'm out there, I'm seeing what's going on in the business world or, you know, in in skincare and wellness, because you want to you want to understand what's going on, but at the same time, whether you realize that a lot of times you start bringing in your ego instead of saying, what is it truly that I need to provide to the world or even to my children? Like, what is everybody else's kids doing? Instead of saying, what is it that my children need at this moment of their education or whatever it may be? But there are also the moments where when you tune out and you tune in, and it can be so minimal you know, you just have set your day appropriately and you're feeling it that everything comes to you so easily. And I yes. learned that very on uh, early on in my life. And um, I love that. And we're going to get to a couple of your practical tips of how to really achieve that. But I will say you touched upon within your true self, the love aspect of it. And there's a story that you have in there that I Adore. It's about the Himalayan, which I've never heard of this animal, the Himalayan musk deer. Oh, yeah. And and you say you can tell a little bit about the, the story, but you mention how you really don't get love from others. It's just that some people prompt you to feel the love that is already in you. Yes. And you know, I think that's one of the practical steps into being creative or whatever, you know, each of your steps, but love is truly one of the base and we have to love ourselves first. But do you yeah. want to tell the story about <laughs> deer? I'll summarize this story because I didn't know about this either, but it's the Himalayan musk deer. So it's a specific type of deer in India. And there's a certain time of year where mu- the smell of musk gets released and secreted and it's actually from a sack inside of their um, abdominal wall. So the musk is coming from inside the deer's body and they start to smell the musk and they start to see where is this coming from? They get really excited and they start kind of looking around and they look under the rocks and they look, where is this coming from? And sadly and truthfully, some of them get so excited that they get so annoyed that they can't find the smell that they literally work themselves up, to, up into a frenzy that some of them go off the cliffs And they're just so desperate and they fall to their deaths off these cliffs because they cannot find the source of the musk. All the while, the musk came from inside of them. So I do feel that story was very appropriate to put in the love chapter because we, um, you know, to your point again before, we're always, if we're always out here, we need to be in the world. We need to feed our kids. We need to see what's going on in our field. We need to answer emails. We can't just ignore the world. But at the same time, that needs to be balanced with inner connection and methodizing that, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but really creating mm-hmm. systems. So you're out here, but you're also in here. And so um, when it comes to love, especially in our society, in modern society, Western society, we think that we have to get it from other people. And that kind of validates who we are. But again, that goes back to the ego. It's like if if I have enough followers on social media and they like enough posts, it means that I'm liked. It means I'm good enough. But then we're relying on outside sources, which Deepak Chopra used to say, if our happiness is a moving target, we will never be happy, right? Everything outside is unpredictable. It can't be controlled. Mm -hmm. And same thing when, you know, a lot of uh, people think that unless they find that significant other, they're not lovable or they're not good enough because they don't have that. But then it's this idea that love has to come outside of us. And the teachings, the ancient teachings are very clear. This is not true. We are love by nature. The, the, the true self is love, energy, light. It's all this very high vibration, high vibration frequency. So just like the musk deer, Instead of trying to get it, that means we're again identifying with the ego and we're trying to get something for the ego versus when we connect to who we are. We realize, oh, the love is inside of me. I have so much love to share. It actually changes our frequency. And there's a part in the book where I talk about um, the theory consciousness of resonance and synchronicity. This has been studied in science, you know, vibration. We start to become more of a source of love and it's very magnetic. People start to come to us, including potential partners, because there isn't this desperation of like, oh, I'm trying to get love. So what, you know, what you wrote, um, Christine, is true. Some people, you know, your husband, my husband, it's like this mirror, like this love that we see. So we feel the love, but we're not getting love from them. It's making us feel the love that's inside of us. 
And same thing with our children, which are these beautiful, amazing drops of consciousness. And, you know, they, they light up all this love in us. Like I said, my sons have just burst open my heart chakras, but it's still coming from inside of me. I'm not getting it from them. Getting, when we start to try to get stuff, it means we suffer if people don't like our social media posts. It means we we feel like, oh, this affects my self-worth if, you know, our kid says something mean or they grow up. I was just going to say, if it's a kid and you're, you discipline them and then they're, you know, unhappy about it. And sometimes, yeah, we feel bad or you become the parent that's never disciplining. And it's like, what is that doing for your child in that sense too? You know, we have to understand that. We are providing them love through yes. all of that. And, and it will make yes. you feel comfortable with those decisions to keep them safe. Well, and also, and also disciplining them is about creating a, a, a safe, healthy mm -hmm. framework for them to grow. Otherwise, like that's what real love is. We want them to be, you know, healthy, uh, you know, grow into adulthood as like a healthy, functioning whole human. If we're scared of getting love taken away, again, that's the ego saying, I don't want to discipline you because you won't love mama in the same way. But that's, that's the wounded part of us thinking we have to be validated from the outside. We have to get love from the outside. So again, it's just a shift of identifying from the ego to the true self, which comes mm -hmm. through these series of practices, awarenesses, journal exercises, certain kinds of meditation, spending time in there. And we start to totally, totally reframe our whole life. And guess what, Christine? All your relationships become a lot healthier. And I think I love that you talk about, well, yeah, love is relationships. And that's how it is completely applied. And I feel like I still know so many women who are looking for love, whether they had whether they've been married or not even been married yet, and they're in their forties right now. And there is a fear that comes into that. And I'm sure there is, you know, I don't want to say a self-worth that comes into it. I would hope not. I would hope they would feel what their self-worth is, but you know, you feel a little different, like things are going on around you. Point being is that I love hearing this because for me, when I moved to Los Angeles many, many years ago, I had gotten out of a not great relationship. And not knowing these exact principles, but knowing some principles, I was like, instead of thinking about all the bad things I had been through, or if that person would come into my thoughts, I would say, knock the him out of my thoughts, and but think about what I want instead. So if it was a certain personality thing or something he would do to me, I would think the opposite. Mm. And to be honest, before I was even, and for me, it was so healing. I mean, mm. you, there's one part, or you talk in the book about when you picked up um, your book at the very beginning that you were reading, you felt this like heat sensation mm. in you and like magic yeah. sparks. We've all felt that. Like, that's what I would feel like all the time. Like, it was just like I was like melting away any pain and just creating all this fire of love inside me. And I was in such a great place. Still didn't want a relationship though, because I was not looking. And my husband came to me within like two months of moving to Los Angeles. We're both from Pittsburgh. We wow. could have met there. We never did. But I always stand on those principles and tell, you know, other people that and it I can see now how it's applying to this where I was truly oh, yes. loving, you know, I was finding that love. Well, it's within it myself. Yeah, it sounds like, Christine, instead of being like the victim of like, oh, me, this sucks, you know, like, you know, kind of that lower vibration. And there's mm -hmm. um, in the book, you know, I talk about Dr. David Hawkins and other psychologists who've actually tried to create measurable scales of consciousness in certain vibrations. When we are in that victim um, mindset, it's it's actually repellent and it keeps things away and people away. So the fact that you shifted into love love, joy, peace, the highest vibrations means without all the efforting, without all the pushing, things start to come in. You know, there's that chapter on magnetism as well. Mm -hmm. And I can say, Christine, I had a similar experience where, you know, I think the mind is tricky and I think we all have self-worth issues until we're fully, you know, united divine consciousness. And I remember when I, when I moved out with Emerson, who was, you know, not even two, he was, um, you know, I think 19 months or so, 18 months, 19 months, I remember thinking to myself, is anybody going to want me as a single mom? You know, I just felt like I had this label on myself, like I was a single mom. And then I went into that deep period of connecting inside, which helped me to reframe my thinking. It helped me to 
just loosen the shackles of being so identified with all these labels we put on ourselves. And then as I describe in my book, just, you know, some months after that, I just was at a, as a, at a dinner party with a bunch of people I didn't know. It was someone who came on my podcast, actually. Um, and, and, you know, we just kind of hit it off. And I, I went to this party and there was hubby John. And he said, and in 15 minutes of meeting me, he's like, oh, that's my wife. Yes, that's what happened to us. Too. And so it was, it was like, you know, we can say from experience, Christine, it's not this like efforting it's, it starts from the inside. We hear self-love. We hear these things. We may see like an inspiring quote on Instagram, but it's really about, you know, when I say in the book, love is, is not a noun. Love is a verb. It's action. It needs to be experienced. And we need to do these practices to actually shift the vibration in our being. And then it starts to take outward form in, in love, healthy relationships, more success, whatever it is, it has to start with inner vibration. I love that. It's beautiful. The Keep It Simple Sexy podcast is brought to you by KO Body Care. So tell me if this sounds familiar. You have a ton of high-end serums and creams for your face, but nothing of the same quality for the skin on your body. And that's where my company, KO Body Care, comes in. Our skincare products are made with the same powerful, transformative ingredients as luxury facial products, but they're formulated just for the skin on your body. The same goes for our supplements. We use only the highest quality, clean, plant-based ingredients that help your skin glow from the inside out. My two current firming must-haves are our Concentrated Firming Serum. It's our award-winning total body serum to firm, tone, and deeply hydrate topically. I love to add it with our Skin Perfect Next Gen Collagen. It is so much more than just a marine-based collagen. It also has hyaluronic acid, phytoceramides, trace minerals, antioxidants to protect your skin, boost your collagen elastin, and help your skin glow from the inside out. If you're wanting to learn more about KO Body Care supplements and skincare, head to kobodycare.com and use KISS20 for 20% off your first purchase. Hey beauties. So I want to share with you a little bit about why I'm so passionate about our SBO probiotics. You may have probably heard of probiotics by now because they're super popular and probiotics do help to really rebalance your whole system and your health because we know so much is dictated by the proper balance of bacteria in our gut known as our microflora. So why are SBO probiotics? Well, these ones, just like everything else that I love to teach about, these are based on mother nature. They're based in, SBO stands for soil-based organisms. So they're based in the soil, the bacteria in the soil that our ancestors used to eat in small amounts. And that would really help to nourish their guts and to keep them healthy. And that's how our ancestors got their probiotics. This type of probiotic is very hardy. It also survives stomach acid. So it goes into your gut where it proliferates and that's where you get the benefits. SBO probiotics are so powerful. You don't need to refrigerate them. You take them every day and you can get benefits as far as better digestion, more energy, higher immunity, even better skin. I love these probiotics. I stand by them a million percent. I take them every day. I recommend them to all my clients. So check them out for yourself if you haven't yet already over at mysaluna.com and you can use the code wellness15 for 15% off all supplements or skincare, excluding bundles. Again, that's wellness15 for 15% all supplements and skincare, including these amazing SBO probiotics. There's so many topics you have with creativity. We've talked a little bit about love because I want to make sure we're touching upon each just a bit um, is peace. And I think that one in today's day and age, we talk about social media. Well, we talk about love, comparison, creativity, the ego. And I think a lot of it goes back to social media, unfortunately, because we are so aware of everybody around us um, with technology that's that that's available to us. And so it can steal, it can steal our peace. Other things can steal our peace. Emails can steal our peace. Children can steal our peace. Yeah. But I love how you, I love the story of how you start your chapter. And if you can tell everybody just a little bit, I mean, it could be any story I'm sure, but I feel like when we're in the wellness world, 
people think everything comes easily, whether it's like, will Christine, you're, you stay a certain shape because you just are that way, or it's so easy to eat clean for you, or, you know, it's easy to be at peace and get everything accomplished. So can you first share yeah. <laughs> a little bit of what your life actually looks like, and then um, some actionable steps that you've yes. learned about peace as yeah. well to help regain it. Oh, yes. I have a lot to say about this subject. So the, <laughs> the story I think you're talking about, Christine, is where I'm like, you know, kind of writing an email. And then, you know, I look up and, um, oh, my gosh, you know, my son's, my older son's smoothie has spilled. Actually, you know, this story, let me talk about what happens in the mornings. Like this morning, I'll give a very real example because the mornings before, now we started school, it's even crazier. So in the morning, you know, baby is in, all four of us are in the bed before the sun comes up. And then I'm like, okay, you know, I wake up. And if I look at my email, a lot of my team is on the East Coast. So there's all these like urgent things. And so I'm trying to get over, you know, some this email that has to happen. And at the same time, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like burning breakfast. And my son's like, where's my food, mama? And then the baby stops wailing and it starts wailing. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to change his diaper. And then and then I'm like going to change his diaper. And then, you know, I'm kind of dressed to drop my other son off at school. And then baby spits up on me. So then I have to change again. I have to get him fed. And then I was like, what was that email I was supposed to send? And I'm in the middle of a text. Be like, oh, there's a great podcast guest. And it's like all these like sort of half finished things because mm -hmm. that's the chaos of life, right? So thank you for saying like- It, it is my mean. daily life. <laughs> It's like, but it's like, you know, eight yeah. arms, right? It's like mm -hmm. breakfast and emails and texts. And especially when we're juggling so much and it's, it's true. Like there are so many different things like, you know, motherhood is here. And then, you know, the book, the podcast, the business, the team, the Saluna circle. Like I do these circles with women. I'm holding space for a lot of other women too. So there's just like a lot. So, um, I do have a lot of things to say because I feel that exponentially my, my peace, my levels of peace, even though my life is more full than it has ever been, um, my peace levels are much higher. And um, these are things I love to share about because I think if I could do it, every other you know human can work towards this as well. It's very straightforward, very practical. There's things that really help. And I think there are things that really take away from peace. So even in the middle of a full life with everything going on, there's a, sun, there's a Sanskrit word, there's a teaching in Ayurveda that is Dinacharya, and that means daily routine. So when we start to, and Yogananda uses the term methodize your life, when we start to create systems that our body can count on no matter what is going on outside, in the middle of chaos, there's still this inner center. There's still this inner calm. So even though there's stuff going on, I still don't freak out. I don't take it as seriously a lot now. Now, five years ago, three years ago would have been a different story. But I just have that these practices that keep me centered. So what that means is I do meditate every morning. And I know this can be like, if you're listening to this, you're like, oh my gosh, but you know, my baby gets up really early. Mine does too. Um, and sometimes I would meditate after first nap, but now his sleep schedule has shifted. So I get up at five and I meditate and that mm -hmm. just number one practice to keep me centered. Number mm -hmm. two, I drink the same elixir every morning. First thing in my body is hot, good for digestion. It's, um, Ginger, water, hot water, lemon, very simple. But the body knows, okay, this heat is coming in. And Ayurveda teaches this, you know, this warming um, sort of denseness, dense liquid in the body helps to center you. It keeps you, your nervous system coming back in. And mm -hmm. so I have the same, you know, glowing green smoothie, although I vary the ingredients. It's like boom, boom, fiber, you know, no matter what's going on. And then I have, you know, different practices during the day. And then I have my evening practice at night. I try to do avayanga, which only takes three minutes, which is a warm oil massage. Mm -hmm. um, I just put oils on my body, which helps bring me here. I take a warm shower, I journal, and then I meditate. So I will say that my days are very unpredictable. There's a lot of stuff going on, as you know, with kids, with work and stuff. Mm -hmm. But certain practices are always there. So what that does is it starts to regulate your system, your nervous system. 
your sleep system. I try to go to bed the same time every night. I try to wake up the same, same time. I try generally to eat the same time. We have family dinner around the same time every evening. And we always start with our gratitude practice. So I think even in a busy life, if you can have at least, you know, one or two things you count on that you do every morning before it gets crazy. And I would not include one of those things is going on social media, but just yeah. things that you do to center things that you do in the evening. And also what's really important to calmness and peace, Christine is again, balancing being out here and being inside. So the meditation. And then the third part that you said about social media, because it's so much what other people are doing, the way I've managed that in my life, because in the beginning, I felt like, oh my God, it's like chaos in here. There's so much going on. Like it really started to make me feel um, not peaceful as mm -hmm. I batch. So I only go on social media certain times. And then I write my posts out in advance, except for my spontaneous personal posts, but mm -hmm. you know, the information I put out and then it gets scheduled. So I'm not in there like scrambling. What do I post today? What do I do? Like spending so much power and energy into it. It's mm -hmm. methodized. Here's what I'm doing. Here's when I'm on. And the rest of the time I'm like connecting with myself or my kids. And it really doesn't rule my life. You know, there's so much to take from that. I always talk about rituals and yes. we think about it, especially in learning for children to have these patterns for them in the morning or when they go to bed and they're taking their clothes off and they're putting their clothes away before they get into the bed, obviously. So their room is cleaner. It's a better environment, but it's like, it makes, it's peaceful for them. There are things we don't have to think about it. And it's the same thing for adults. It's like, it's these minimal patterns that you don't have to think about. It is whatever, you know, please, if there's even one thing that you take today, I think that can start to lead you into better patterns in your life. It is truly just finding a ritual in the morning and yes. a ritual in the evening and continue to add to that and allow a little bit of that chaos in the middle. Um, and something that is giving back to you for sure. So maybe meditation is a step out from where you are today, but it could just be waking up and taking some deep breaths and exactly do not reach for your emails. And I had to learn that too in social yeah. media, trying to get it done before I grab the baby in the morning, especially because you're just truck going. Instead, as soon as I open my eyes, I thank the Lord for the day, for my health, and go into that full gratitude. And that's my yeah. portion of the meditation because I am creating or I'm saying what I want that day to be to, be, to become. And for me too, it was like once I had the second baby, I got away from a little bit of it because you feel more frazzled again because you're hand juggling too. And you just have to like get back to it and see what works in your life. So for me, I was like, okay, I was so far away. I was like, I'm going to add five minutes of meditation in the mornings. And I'm going to add five minutes of like foam rolling and breathing, which honestly, it goes to so much longer for both of them. But if you say it's like so minimal for you, then you it's easier to jump into. It's not 30 minutes. It's not one hour, right? It's just like two minutes. It could be two minutes. And you just yes. start adding those to your life. Well, and also the the back to the practical nature of these um, practical enlightenment meditations that I put out every week, which are free on our app and on the site, like anyone can access them. They're always mm -hmm. about seven minutes. And so I do feel the less you have to think in the morning, especially when you're establishing a new habit, a new ritual, the easier you get to that flow. So mm -hmm. if you just sit and I'm guiding you through and it's seven minutes, I tell you what to breathe. I tell you what to do with your body. And you just sort of relax into it. So you know that if you wake up eight minutes earlier, which, you know, again, if we can all create eight minutes just to, mm -hmm. to go on your phone, turn on the app, get on the meditation, sit and do it. That is not, that's like a tiny fraction of your day. And to your point, it sets the energetic tone of the day. It keeps you a lot more centered in here. I found mm -hmm. with clients that doing these meditations in the morning have a tremendous impact on helping to ward off food cravings later, which are another way of just trying to shift our mood by something external. So if we're centered, we're in our breath, we're in our body, it makes, it pays spades, it pays us back in dividends, like so much throughout the rest of the day, seven minutes, eight minutes, give yourself that gift, commit to that one thing. And um, it really opens up your whole life. So as we're talking about these, you know, morning meditations, I think a lot of meditations or an easy way where you can start are affirmations. And I love 
one of these, this chapter in your book as well, because we hear about affirmations all the time. We keep coming back to social media. We see this and people are like, I am good at this. I'm good at this. But you say, (laughs) not that people are doing it all wrong, but that there is an effective way to say and and become and perform your affirmations. Please. We all need this in our life. Can you give us some helpful tips on how to actually effectively do this to make that energy come into your life instead of really just kind of saying it? Right. So first of all, I'll say that a lot of us toss around words pretty, um, you know, in a non-serious way. Like we just chat around or we just say things that we don't mean, right? Or then we try to retract And there's just like a lot of words being passed around and we don't really honor the power of the word. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to ancient times that, you know, word is a seed, um, goes from a thought into like something that you're speaking out into the ether and it has the potential to start actually creating form around it. So for instance, I talked about this in my third book, The Beauty Detox Power, when people have a really hard time losing weight and they keep saying to themselves, I'm so fat, I'm so fat, reinforcing this whole belief. There's real power in our words and there's so much research to back to back this up. There's Hello, ones- all women out there. I feel like I've heard every single person say, my butt, my this, my that, right? Stop. Yeah. So just Dang. become aware <laughs> of what you're saying, because even though we live in a society where words get tossed around, there Mm -hmm. is great power in the frequency and vibration of word, the word, right? Mm -hmm. The word, Mm -hmm. people talk about the Bible, the word, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to just become aware of that. The second thing is, you know, for the past hundred years or so in self-help circles, affirmations have been, you know, talked about, but kind of in the surface way, you know, where it's kind of like it got this bad rap. And then I remember there, there was this Saturday Saturday Night Live skit where I forget the guy's name and he was like, make, he's looking in the mirror and he was like, people really <laughs> love me. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so ridiculous. And my boyfriend at the time was like, look at this. Like, it's just so ridiculous. Affirmations are so ridiculous. And, you know, it's, it's sad because some things that can have real truth And, you know, in our culture can just kind of get washed away because of the connotation. But Yogananda, the great yogic teachings talk about affirmations in a very specific way where they can be very effective. We, first of all, so we're not just going to say words like I'm so in shape and deep down we know or we don't think we're in shape, then we're just lying to ourselves. And so it just becomes this kind of this waste of energy. So there's this whole process. There's a whole chapter in the book. Um, I'll try to summarize some of the key points here, though. Of course, you know, you had to kind of go into it, into the background Mm -hmm. and all of it. But one thing I'll say is you want to be in a clear space where you've at least worked to settle some of your thoughts, the monkey mind, before you try attempt any affirmation. So what does that mean? This means that one of the most potent periods, if not the most potent period to work on affirmations is after you meditate. Because after that point where you've, you know, you're working on your breathing, you're going inside, you're settling down your thoughts, you're not trying to push them away, but you're in a much more clear space. You need to have that clear space before you're trying to introduce a new thought pattern. The second thing is we put our full focus into the affirmation. So this is not a time for be for multitasking. You're not supposed to be just saying the affirmation and then you're kind of like reading an email or you're also, you know, playing with your child. You want to be really present when we're doing this. So you're really like integrating with the meaning behind the words. So we're not just saying the words in an empty way. And then as Yogananda taught, you want to go from saying the words out loud. So again, there's that sound vibration into integrating them. So you start to say it softly and softly more silently. So you're starting to merge your frequency with the energy and the intention behind the word. So there's this whole process of you know clearing, going in, and then working with it in a deeper way. And I can say, Christine, that I've done the process that I teach in the book myself and amazing things have happened, um, including, you know, the first time I became a New York Times bestseller, I was working with this. Now, 
you know, and I also tell the story in that chapter about Dan Butner, who's a friend of mine. He's also been on the podcast. He founded the Blue Zones. And so he had this affirmation. He had this declaration that he made about cycling Africa. And he really worked with it and worked with it. And it powered him to powered him through 12,200 miles to get from Tunisia down to Cape Town. And he set the Guinness Book of World Records. So the thing about affirmations is it starts to focus you, but you are the one that still has to take constructive action. You need to use that focus and that power and that confidence you feel behind the words and it will give you insight. It will strengthen your intuition into, oh, I need to email this person or I need to pursue this person. I should reach out to this. Da, 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 da. It doesn't mean you start saying stuff. You know, like I think The Secret, my dad always used to make fun of this movie. I didn't see it. My, my mom made him watch it. I think there was this part where this little boy was like, I want a bicycle. And then the bicycle, someone knocks on the door and gives him a bicycle or something like that. It's not like that. It's not like yeah. we just say something and it shows up. We have to take, you know, what yoga says is right action, right? But affirmations help to attune us to that right action. It helps us The right us. decisions. Exactly yes. what you're saying. I, yes. I can absolutely understand this, like the intuition to make the right choices where I feel like if you're going for a goal and something comes along and you're like, you know, maybe it was like you with the best selling book that you wanted to be with this publisher in this way. And that was the first opportunity. But Perhaps if you were already meditating on this, creating that affirmations, creating the intentions to it, your intuition then tells you for whatever reason, this opportunity that looks amazing isn't the right one. And you end up finding something else comes along and that's the perfect one that leads you on that right path. You know, it could be that's a man, like everything written down or woman, partner, whoever looks perfect, but you keep feeling this something digging inside of you, right? And yes. then really the true perfect opportunity comes along or it's a doctor telling you that you need to be on this medication. Like through my years of fertility, my intuition was just like, you need to do this on your own. You need to find the root cause and you need to heal it. But I kind of kept going back because I'd be like, everybody's doing fertility, like, you know? Mm. And finally I was like, I'm done. And everything worked out <laughs> because I kept learning, you know, listening to my intuition. And I will say my affirmations for having, I've always wanted to adopt, but I wanted to birth too, because I wanted to experience mm. birth, not to have a biological baby. But I always knew that I would have one. I just, yes. like, it was such a deep, and I was like, I don't know how it's going to come. I don't know what age it's going to come, but I was so at peace with it. Mm, mm. And once I found that deep peace, you know, after all the years of fertility, which I think was a little bit of madness and being lost. And that's mm. what a lot of people feel. And the affirmations are your guidance, you know, and it goes back to then you originally finding the love and understanding what you want and what not what your ego wants. Like this is all right. everything you're talking about is that it's connected. Well, that feeling of being lost is, mm -hmm. you know, I think the you know, another attribute of the ego, because it's like I want things to be this certain way in this certain time frame. And then when it doesn't turn out that way, I start to feel overwhelmed. I feel lost. An important quality of enlightenment is openness. We open up to, you know, the greater plan of spirit. We open up to all the possibilities of the universe, the infiniteness. So when we do affirmations in this way, we are open. And so we have that um, more of a clear channel to listening to our intuition, which is the voice of the true self come through mm -hmm. authentic intuition, not the ego trying to push its way. And so I mentioned this too in the book, Christine, when I met my husband, I was so open. I was so peaceful. My husband is, you know, 80% of his body is covered in tattoos. He has a gold grill. You know, I'm plant-based. And when I met him, he was this huge, you know, meat eater and completely, you know, MMA motorcycle guy, completely different than me. But I was so open and I could just feel our heart connection. Aww. And if I wasn't in that open place, Again, I think a lot of us- Red flag. Up. It would have been a red flag. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it, it would have been my like- My husband's the same way though. It's the same It would have been way. like not my type. Yeah. I only date vegan yogis and all this yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. So um, I think that a lot of us, um, when we open up, you know, we say we want the love. We say we want these opportunities, but we may not realize that we're actually going by opportunities all the time because our ego has this, you know, it blocks us. 
So part of this whole, you know, process and what I talk about in the book is connecting deeper to that voice, to that intuition with these steps so that you can, you know, really be open to the best stuff coming through and the best stuff and the best decisions to make that, um, that are there for you. Maybe you just don't see them. You don't, you're not tuned into them yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like this book is truly so amazing, Kimberly. Yeah. Even just speaking with you today after reading it, there's so much potential for everybody. And these really are practical tips of understanding these things that we talk about all the time or or have experienced but don't understand that there is an actual pattern and a, sim a simplicity to how we can achieve it again, over and over again, um, and find the peace, the love, the creativity. Uh, it, it was how you you described it, an epic, inspiring life. Like I just <laughs> absolutely love that. Are there any anything else? I mean, there are so many other tips in your, your new book, You Are More Than You Think You Are. But is there anything else that we've touched upon so much that you want to touch upon today? Well, there, there's one more thing I want to add, Christy. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, you know, you talked about these these moments where we're like, oh, we're clear. This really worked out. And we kind of think, oh, this was really lucky or this was so random. This happened. This is a term called um, synchro destiny um, that Deepak mm -hmm. actually says too, which is something I have experienced personally where more of these so-called like amazing people that you happen to meet, you happen to be in the right place at the right time. Or, you know, when we were looking to buy our farm, we had this thought and then the you know, best place came. We got into escrow in three weeks. You know, all these amazing things, they start to happen more and more because we realize there is a method, methodology to this. There's a way to create these synchronicities and these opportunities. It's not random. The, the universe is highly intelligent. And so when we tap into, you know, what Yogananda calls the underlying energy matrix, when we start to work on ener with energy in a deeper way, we start to really get more and more of the best stuff in our life. This flow, these amazing happenings and occurrences and meetings without all the pushing and pulling. There's a real mm -hmm. method to do that. And I'm so excited to share it in this book. And um, I want everybody to live their most filling, amazing lives. Really, I um, that really is my true intention. And I think, you know, if you're feeling like you keep hitting a wall or you're working triply as hard, doubly as hard, or just too hard to attain those dreams that you want, whether it is relationships, it is, you know, maybe you're dealing with issues with your children. It could be, you know, your businesses. I think there's just so many ways we can hit a wall. Then this, you, you really do need to read this book yeah. and just start to take one of these actionable steps a day um, yeah. and, and change it. I love it to find that. What is it? Synchronicity. That's right. And With then the part universe. of it, one degree at a time, we start to just shift a little bit and those little sh shifts start to like really change the frequency and then you keep going and going. But little shifts make big changes. I love that, Kimberly. I mean, I've learned so much from you today. You are always just the most open, beautiful soul. And thank you for shining your light on us today. And I know that the, your book and just even, you know, today's episode is going to help so many people. Amazing. Thank you so much, Christine. I feel so connected to you. I just love you as a, as a human, as a soul, as a mama. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in today on Keep It Simple Sexy. I hope that today's episode helps to lighten your burdens, helps you to achieve that synchronicity with the universe around you, and helps you to achieve your dream destiny much quicker much quicker. <laughs> Achieve it and much faster. For information on Kimberly, go to on her Instagram page at underscore Kimberly Snyder. We have it up there for you. And to find about everything about her wellness brand, her books, um, her inner circle, go to mysaluna.com. And don't forget, you can visit today's notes of today's podcast for bulleted highlights of actionable steps you can apply to your daily health routines. Thanks for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and feel free to share this with a friend who needs to hear it. Have questions you need answered? Text me at 1-310-361-8697. Make sure you're following me on social at Christine Bullock and have a healthy, happy week. See you next time.